Okay, in this video, we're going to continue on in the 2.1 notes. We're going to look at um, topic three uh, in this video. In topic three, we're going to talk about two specific type of organelles, um, membrane-bound organelles, that are found in eukaryotic cells that um, have functions related to energy and um, acquiring energy and producing energy for the cell. And so that specifically, where those two organelles that we're, we're going to talk about are the, the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, and the chloroplast. Um, just to remind you guys that mitochondria are found in all eukaryotic um, cells and in eukaryotic organisms. And then the chloroplast, that's another energy-related organelle that's found specifically in plant cells. Um, but let's start with the mitochondria, since it's found in all eukaryotic cells. Um, again, not in prokaryotic cells, just eukaryotic cells. It is a membrane-bound organelle, um, and we'll quickly go over the structure of the mitochondria. There's some different pieces here of this organelle that you guys need to know. Um, it does have a double membrane, kind of like the nucleus that we talked about in the last video. Um, it has two sets of membranes surrounding the, the mitochondria, and so the, uh, the outer one is called the outer membrane. That's the membrane on the outside, and then there's an inter um, an inner membrane uh, with it inside the outer membrane. So there's the inner membrane, then there's the outer membrane, and then there's a space between the inner and outer membrane. That's called the intermembrane space. So the space between, the space right here between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, we call that the intermembrane space. And then if you were to go into the inside, inside of the mitochondria, so inside the outer membrane, inside the inner membrane, you would get to the very middle here, this area inside of the um, mitochondria. This is called the matrix or the mitochondrial matrix, the very inside space of the mitochondria. Um, the, uh, another thing to point out here is that the inner membrane of the mitochondria has all these foldings. So there's a lot of folding of this inner membrane. Those folds are called cristae, um, which are these, these folds that we see on the, the inner membrane. That's the, the basic structure of the mitochondria. Um, inside the mitochondria, there are a bunch of um, specialized enzymes inside the mitochondria who are doing very specific types of reactions. And the reactions that we find going on inside the mitochondria allow uh, the, the mitochondria to um, perform aerobic cellular respiration. So aerobic cellular respiration is a magical process that we will talk about in a lot of detail in unit three, our next unit. Um, but for now, just know that it's this process where inside the cell, specifically in the mitochondria, it is fully breaking down sugar molecules and taking the energy from sugar molecules um, and using that energy to make ATP. And then ATP is this energy molecule that um, is widely used throughout the cell to, to do energy demanding processes. So there's a lot of things happening in the cell that require energy. Um, and ATP is this nifty little molecule that easily provides that energy in a very convenient, um, efficient way. And ATP, that this energy molecule that the cell likes to use, this is that molecule is made in the mitochondria through this process called aerobic cell respiration. And so they're taking uh, all this energy from um, sugar and using it to make ATP. Uh, and specifically, we call it aerobic. Aerobic means that it, it's an oxygen requiring process. So this process uses oxygen. So if if there's oxygen available and with the, with the presence of oxygen in the mitochondria, we can fully break down sugar molecules and the energy stored in those sugar molecules and use that energy to make ATP. That's what's going to happen in the mitochondria. Um, and so that's what makes the mitochondria very special is its ability to use oxygen to help extract energy from, from sugar, which again, we'll talk about that in a lot of detail in unit three. Um, but here's the overall reaction for cellular respiration, which you guys should already know, but just for now, at least know the basic reaction here. So it, in, in cellular respiration, this process taking place inside the mitochondria, there's sugar molecules like glucose, usually C6H12O6, that's um, being used with oxygen, which is O2. Um, and those two things are going to be used in the mitochondria. And inside the mitochondria, those things will become carbon dioxide molecules and water molecules. And then we'll be able to make a bunch of ATP in that process. So these are the products of cell respiration. These are the reactants of cell respiration. Um, and then um, it's also important to point out that cells, cells usually don't just have one mitochondria. Cells usually have many mitochondria inside of their cells. 
Um, muscle cells, for example, can have hundreds of mitochondria inside of their, their cells. Um, so obviously cells that are using more energy or requiring more energy are probably going to have more mitochondria. Um, muscle cells require a lot of energy to move your guys' to contract your skeleton and move your body in different ways. Um, now the chloroplast, let's talk about that. That is another membrane bound organelle that's found in eukaryotes. Specifically, this organelle is only found in um, plant cells, not in animal cells. Uh, here's the, a basic diagram of a, a chloroplast, or I guess a detailed diagram of a chloroplast. Um, just like the mitochondria, the, the chloroplast also has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. So you can see this outer membrane, and then you can see this inner membrane. Um, and then there's actually a third set of membranes on the inside, inside of the chloroplast. If you go into the outer membrane and then past the inner membrane, you get to this space here. And then inside there, you're going to see another set of membranes, which form these, these stacked discs, these stacked membrane discs. Um, those stacked membrane discs are called thylakoids. So a thylakoid is one of these membrane surrounded discs that we find in chloroplast. Um, those thylakoids are stacked on top of each other to form a structure called a, a granum. A granum is a stack of thylakoids. And so those are the on the, the inside of the, the chloroplast. Um, so there's all the membranes. And then talking about, so then there's a bunch of different spaces here, if you guys are thoroughly keeping keeping track of what's going on here. So there's there's an outer membrane and an inner membrane. So there, there is a space between them. And again, just like the mitochondria, we call that the intermembrane space. That's the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. And then you have the inside inside of the chloroplast, which is this space in here where all these discs are. That's called the stroma. So the stroma is this space, kind of where my mouse is pointing, the space inside the inner membrane. So if you go into the outer membrane, into the inner membrane, you're now in the stroma. And in the stroma, you're going to see these thylakoid membrane discs. And then you could even go into the thylakoid. So in the thylakoid, there's another space in the inside, inside, inside of the chloroplast, this space in the very inside of these thylakoid discs. That's called the, thylato the thylakoid space, um, or sometimes we call it the thylakoid lumen, which is the inside of the, th the thylakoids. It's a lot of different spaces there in the chloroplast. Um, and then the main function of the chloroplast is... Uh, to do photosynthesis. So chloroplasts contain this green pigment called chlorophyll, which um, along with a bunch of other enzymes that allow photosynthesis to occur. And so in the chloroplast, what's happening is um, energy from light is going, there's going to be energy absorbed from light via these pigment molecules called chlorophyll. And the chloroplast is going to use that energy from light to start building organic molecules, um, to start building some simple carbohydrates like sugar, like glucose, um, along with, which will then allow the cell to start building lots of other types of organic molecules. And so um, that, that energy from the sun, like I said, is going to be now turned into chemical energy in the form of, of molecules inside the cell. Um, and the overall reaction of what's going on here, you can see it here, uh, just the basic, basic overall big picture of what's going on in photosynthesis is there's, there's energy from light being used along with carbon dioxide and water. So we can think of these as the reactants, carbon dioxide molecules. you got some water molecules, CO2 and H2O. And in the chloroplast, um, it's going to turn into that, that stuff is going to be used to build carbohydrates, like um, um, mostly glucose, for example, C6H12O6, um, and some other simple carbohydrates. Um, and then in the process of that happening, oxygen gas gets produced also as a product. Um, Kind of a byproduct. It was just made by accident during this this process. Um, lucky for us because we need that oxygen. Um, but that's that's the overall th reaction. So these are the reactants: the carbon dioxide in the water. And I guess you can consider light as kind of like a reactant um, or the energy from light. And then the products are carbohydrates and oxygen, or you could even just say sugar and oxygen. Um, and that sugar that's then made by photosynthesis in this process can then be um, used in the plant cell to build lots of other organic molecules um, and combine with lots of other things to start building even like amino acids to build proteins. And we can start using that stuff to then turn it into like uh, fatty acids and glycerol to build lipids, or um, we can start building it into using it to build nucleotides to build DNA. And so plants can take that as a starting point to start building other organic molecules that are needed inside the cell. 
Um, and then a lot of that sugar will just go to the mitochondria, which plant cells also have a mitochondria, and they will use that sugar to do cell respiration to make ATP because plant cells also need ATP to power everything that's going on in the cell. Um, so I guess the, the, the biggest concept here is this, 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 I, or the fact that plants through this process of photosynthesis, which is possible because of this organelle, the chloroplast, they're able to build their own organic molecules from from scratch kind of so they can take inorganic thing ran, random molecules like co2 and h2o from their environment and use that to start building organic molecules from those simple molecules which is super crazy cool because um that is a very magical process because a lot of other cells in life on this planet can't do that and including our cells we we can't photosynthesize meaning that we we can't build organic molecules from scratch. We can build organic molecules from other organic molecules and we turn organic molecules into different organic molecules. Our, our cells can definitely do that, but they can't build organic molecules from starting molecules like CO2 and H2O. We have to eat food, which is from other living, like we're gonna eat other living things or once living things. And we're gonna take their organic molecules and then start building our own stuff with their organic molecules. But we can't, we cannot build our own organic molecules from scratch. Whereas plants, they can, which is why you don't see trees out there eating squirrels or anything like that. Like they, they don't have to eat other living things. They can build this stuff from scratch. Pretty cool. Um, and just like mitochondria, there's plant cells can have many, many chloroplasts. They can have lots, hundreds of chloroplasts inside of their cells. Um, and then we end with this last but very important complicated thing called uh, the endosymbiotic theory. And so... Um, there's this, this theory that you guys need to start knowing starting um, now in this unit called the endosymbiotic theory. And this theory kind of explains how it might have been possible for eukaryotic cells to evolve from prokaryotic cells. So it's been well confirmed in the fossil record that the first life on this planet was prokaryotic, which makes total sense because they're pretty simple cells. So probably life got started with some simple prokaryotic cells. And then from those prokaryotic cells, the big question is, well, how did we end up with these really complicated cool, exciting eukaryotic cells that are going to build plants and animals and multicellular organisms. Um, and so this theory explains how eukaryotic cells might have actually evolved from prokaryotic cells. Um, and this theory focuses a lot on the presence of mitochondria and chloroplast in eukaryotic cells. And so according to this theory, here's what happened. I'll try to follow along with this. And then I have a picture on the next slide. But um, according to this theory, there was a, uh, a a long time ago, billions of years ago, well, actually two and a half to three billion years ago, there was these early prokaryotic cells that existed on this planet, um, very simple cells. Um, and there were some early prokaryotic cells on this planet who were actually able to do aerobic cell respiration without a mitochondria. Like these cells found a way to, to do cell respiration and make a lot of ATP using energy from like sugar molecules. And so they're, they're called aerobic prokaryotes. Um, they can use oxygen to make a lot of ATP, which is something that does exist. There are bacteria cells who can do cell respiration using oxygen, um, which is pretty unique to some bacteria because a lot of bacteria, a lot of prokaryotes can do that. But there, there were some that could, okay? They can, they can do cell respiration. They learned, evolved how to do that. Um, and so then what, according to this theory, is there was this larger prokaryotic cell that engulfed these smaller aerobic prokaryotes, these, these prokaryotes that were able to, to, to do cell respiration using oxygen, they were swallowed by or engulfed by a, these larger prokaryotic cells. And then they actually ended up forming a symbiotic relationship with each other, with that cell living inside the other cell. So that's that aerobic prokaryotic cell was able to make ATP, a lot of ATP very effectively using oxygen and would give that energy to the big cell that ate it and then the big cell that ate it would um provide a, a place and shelter for that cell to live in because it was living inside of it um and provide other nutrients and materials to, to 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 use and so there was this mutual beneficial relationship between the two and over time that um evolved and again this would be like over millions of years we're talking where that relationship evolved so dependently where like now they couldn't live without each other so over millions of years now that thing living inside the other cell um became they became completely dependent on one another and so like they were kind of locked into this relationship now 
Um, and um, it is thought that then eventually over millions and millions of years that that, that, that aerobic prokaryotic cell living in that larger cell evolved into the modern day mitochondria. So the mitochondria we find today in eukaryotic cells used to be a long, long time ago, like a couple billion years ago, was a prokaryotic cell living inside of another prokaryotic cell. And so that's what this, this theory is suggesting. And then later on, so you guys can kind of see that up here. Let me move my face. Um, you can see here's like this prokaryotic cell, and then there's this oxygen using bacterium, this aerobic bacteria that got engulfed by this early prokaryotic cell and is going to evolve over time into the mitochondria. And then later on, somewhere along the line of the timeline of life on this planet, some of these cells that had my, that were starting to evolve mitochondria, they then formed a symbiotic relationship with a second type of prokaryotic cell that they engulfed, um, which were photosynthetic um, prokaryotes. So there there were some there are some prokaryotes that actually that can do photosynthesis without a chloroplast. So this is a thing that exists. There's there's prokaryotic cells that are photosynthetic. They can do photosynthesis just like plants can. They're not plants, but they can do photosynthesis. Um, and so there are these photosynthetic bacterium, prokaryotic cells, um, which we have evidence of in the fossil record of these guys existing like a couple billion years ago. And it's thought that one of those guys was swallowed by the cell that's now contains a mitochondria already. So that already happened, it's starting to evolve this mitochondria. But then it, evol it engulfed and formed this symbiotic relationship with a, a, this other prokaryote that was able to do photosynthesis. And then again, over millions and millions and millions of years of evolution, they formed a super dependent relationship where now they're like locked in to this relationship. Um, they completely depend on each other. And, um, and again, there was mutual benefits both ways. Like obviously that photosynthetic guy was able to start building sugar for the cell and this, the larger cell was able to provide uh, other, I'm sure other nutrients and a living environment, an adequate living environment for that other bacterium. And so, Again, over millions and millions of years, that guy evolved into the modern day chloroplast that we have. Um, and so that's what the endosymbiotic theory suggests. Um, and so this would ultimately explain how we ended up uh, with animal cells who just got the mitochondria, which happened first, and then a subgroup of those cells that had a mitochondria then evolved a chloroplast through a similar mechanism with these, this endosymbiotic relationship. Um, that evolved into the modern day plant cells that we have today. And so um, that's that's the gist of what's going on here according to this theory. And then, um, so you guys need to understand that theory and then you need to know the evidence for it. So there's actually some really solid evidence. It's not just a random idea for, for this being a, a, a huge possibility having occurred a long time ago on this planet. Um, so here are some things that are pretty convincing. First of all, both mitochondria and a chloroplast have a double membrane. Like I said, they have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. They have two sets of membranes surrounding them, um, which is not similar to a lot of the other organelles in the cell, like the, the Golgi and the ER, they don't have double membranes, um, but they do. And that's actually consistent with what happens when a cell engulfs another cell. So if you have a cell that has a membrane, and then this other bigger cell also has a membrane and it's going to engulf, which means it like surrounds it with its own membrane. That cell is that got engulfed is now gonna have two sets of membranes. It's gonna have its original cell membrane and then now it's gonna have a piece of the, the other, the bigger cells cell membrane around it after it got engulfed, which you can kind of see in this picture here, but not really, like it's gonna have its original cell membrane and then this outer membrane around it after it gets engulfed. Like this is, this is what happens when cells engulf things. They surround it with their membrane into a little vesicle that's now inside the cell. Um, so just, I don't know, if you can imagine that, great. If you can't, it doesn't matter. Uh, we'll see examples of that soon. But just know that they have a double membrane, which is what would happen if a cell engulfed another cell. Um, and then also mitochondria and chloroplasts, they actually have their own ribosomes separate from the cell. So the cell, like plant cells and animal cells, they have ribosomes, but inside the mitochondria and the chloroplasts is actually their, they have their own ribosomes that they use to build proteins inside of the chloroplast and inside of the mitochondria. They're building their own proteins using their own ribosomes. And, um, what's crazy is their ribosomes are actually structurally a lot more similar to prokaryotic ribosomes than eukaryotic ribosomes that are in the rest of the cell. 
And so when we actually analyze the ribosome of a mitochondria or a ribosome that came from a chloroplast, it's very similar to the ribosomes we see in prokaryotes today. And it's not as similar to like the other ribosomes who are in the same cell, like out, like the normal ribosomes and the rough ER are just floating around. So that's interesting. And then the mitochondria and the chloroplast, they actually have their own DNA. We'll talk about this a little bit in second semester as well. So in the mitochondria and chloroplast, they actually have, there's DNA in there, which is not in the nucleus. So like you've been told your whole life, a lie, that all the DNA is in the nucleus. Well, actually the chloroplast and mitochondria have their own little pieces of DNA. And those pieces of DNA actually have genes on them, like instructions to build proteins that they use their ribosomes to build. So they're kind of like mini cells operating in a bigger cell. Um, and what's really interesting is the DNA that we find in chloroplast and mitochondria is circular, circular DNA. So if I took out, in your guys' mitochondria, there is DNA. And if I took out that DNA, it's actually circular, which if you remember, prokaryotes have circular DNA, whereas the rest of your DNA in the nucleus is linear. You have linear chromosomes, but in your, in your mitochondria, it's circular. Same thing with the chloroplast, the DNA. Um, so very interesting stuff there. Um, and then also the mitochondria and the chloroplast are, are, are pretty autonomous inside the cell, and they actually can grow and reproduce on their own within the cell, outside of the cell growing and reproducing. So cells, as you guys probably know, they, they grow and then they divide and reproduce into more cells. That happens all the time. But inside of a cell, the mitochondria and chloroplast can actually start replicating themselves whenever they need to. And so like the mitochondria in your guys' cells can sometimes actually copy itself and form more mitochondria, just kind of like how a cell can form more copies of itself. And so um, anyway, those are all pieces of evidence to support this endosymbiotic theory that you guys need to memorize. You need to know these different pieces of evidence. Um, so pretty interesting stuff. And uh, I think that's that's it for this topic. Thank you guys.